Hello and welcome to this, our Year 8 Probability Review, with the rolling of the tongue as well. Right, yep, this is a Year 8 lesson on probability, and so if you are in Year 7 and you are already doing this work, much respect, give yourself a high five, a pat on the back, and a lap around the street. Preferably not if there is a major road outside, because that would be dangerous. So look, let's just recap what we've previously met in probability. We'll go straight into the work. You know, what is a sample space? We've looked at this before, and there's a difference between the sample space and possible outcomes. And that's, that difference is minor, so it's such a minor difference. But when we're doing exams or tests or something in mathematics, it's the notation that's really important. And sadly, examiners do not like sloppy notation. They do not like half stuff. So, for example, you know, if you're doing a square root of 4, then you need to make sure that square root covers all of that. If you're going to do the square root of 3x plus y in that situation, that would look really bad. Why? Because the square root sign needs to go all the way across and down. Silly things like if you put 0.5, that is a big no-no because there is a zero in front of it. We don't need to be that lazy. You know, we're going to recap in this lesson what the PR of 4 means, right? And so, as I say here, by the end of this lesson, hopefully you'll be able to list the possible outcomes, list sample spaces, find out the events of, or the probability of events happening, and this really important word in probability of events not happening. Oh, so let's make a beginning. So, we've met this before, and we'll just do a quick recap, but what are the possible outcomes from flipping a coin or tossing a coin? Well, possible outcomes just need to be a list. And so if we think about a coin, what do we have? We have a head and a tail. And ladies and gentlemen, that is it for the possible outcomes for flipping a coin. All right, let's ramp it up a bit. What about the possible outcomes from rolling a die? Well, how many outcomes are there from rolling a die? Now, this is interesting because the question hasn't been overly specific. Now, if it doesn't say, we would generally assume it is a six-sided die and that is fair. Now remember, what is the opposite of a die being fair? Well, a fair means that there is actually the same probability of all of the numbers happening on that die. And to do, if we were going to draw a table, let's imagine we're going to draw a table here. And then what are the numbers we could get on a die? There's numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So if we were going to look at the probability of rolling a 1 on a standard die, it's 1 out of 6. 2, 1 out of 6. 3, 1 out of 6. 4, 1 out of 6. 5, 1 out of 6. 7, 1 out of 6. And what do we notice about all of these probabilities? They are the same. Yes, they are the same. Which means that it is fair. There is an equal chance of getting each of those numbers. Now, what about a die that is not fair? Well, in maths, we have a special name for something that's not fair. And so if we have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 again, and let's say this was, oh, I don't know, uh, 1 third and 1 sixth and 1 sixth and, oh, I don't know, 1 sixth. And then this would be 1 twelfth and 1 twelfth. Now, in this situation, it would appear that it's more likely that it's going to fall on a 1 than any of the other numbers. And in this case, this dice would be called biased. Really important word to use there, biased. All right, unfair, yes, we could say that, but the correct word to use is biased. So what are the possible outcomes from rolling a normal dice? Well, we've already said there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, if we remember with things called sample space, what is a sample space? Well, a sample space, as far as I'm concerned, or as I teach it, is effectively a list of possible outcomes, list of possible outcomes that are separated by commas and sit inside a pair of curly brackets. Ooh. Okay, so for example, what is the sample space of getting a letter from the following word? Now I try to trick you. There is my word, and it's what all of you guys undoubtedly are brilliant. Yes, indeedy. So let's see. Uh, the sample space are, right, a B, an R, 
and I. And I'm only going to put one L because it's a repeated letter. I'm not going to put this I because I've already got an I. There's an A, there's an N, and there's a T. So those are the possible letters I have to choose from in the words brilliant. And what about this one here? What is the sample space of getting a number bigger than 4 but smaller than 10? Now we're not talking about dice here, we're literally just talking about numbers. So because it's got to be bigger than 4, well 5 is bigger than 4, 6 is bigger than 4, 7 is bigger than 4, 8 and 9, but it's got to be smaller than 10, so that's where we finish. There's my curly braces and job is done. So there's a subtle difference between sample space and possible outcomes. Now we get to the point of describing probabilities, and we've used words previously to describe probabilities. Things like certain, and possible, and impossible, and what else? Uh, likely. Right? These are all possible words we can use to describe probabilities, but that's a very year six thing to do. All right? Year six. We're, we're better than that now. We, we can use fractions, we can use decimals, and we can use percentages. So fractions, we can use decimals and percentages to talk about probabilities. Right? But to be able to do this, we sort of need to know, roughly speaking, what the limits of that is. And as I say here, we can use a scale from zero to hero. Hercules, Disney movie, love, 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 love. But actually, using a scale from zero to hero probably doesn't make a lot of sense. But what we can do is use this scale here. And what does that mean? Well, we have zero as impossible and one means certain. So that means all values for probabilities fall between the numbers zero and one. So does that mean we can have a probability of 1.2? Nope, that wouldn't make any sense. What about a probability of minus six? Nope, that doesn't make sense. And if any lessons you do, you get those type of probabilities, then as far as I'm concerned, big frowny face, face because the chances are you've probably done something wrong. Halfway between that is evens, all right? Which basically means even chance. And then if we think about all these probabilities up here, they're more likely. And if we think of the probabilities down here, they are more unlikely. So we can use those numbers to go between 0 and 1 to help us do probabilities. And what a great couple of questions we have here. Now these questions have come from the Cambridge Essentials textbook series and there is no wish for me to actually uh, infringe copyright. I just thought there were some really, really good questions. So the following events are shown with their probabilities. We have event A has a probability of 0. So A has a probability of 0. Event B has a probability of 0 0.9. Event C has a probability of 1, and event D has a probability of 0 0.5. So if we go back to my little diagram here, A has an event, uh, sorry, a probability of 0. Uh, 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 0 is here. B is 0 0.9, which is sort of more up here. C has 1, uh, 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 we like that, and D is here. So having now sort of written down our probabilities, Let's see what the questions want. Which of the four events is most likely to occur? The one that is most likely to occur has to be the one that is closest to the number one. And as it can include the number one, that to me would suggest that C is my correct answer. Because you can't be any more certain than certain. Which of the four events is sure not to occur, i.e. is impossible? Well, an event of zero means it's fairly impossible. That's A. Which is more likely, event B or event D? So event B is at 0 0.9, event D is at 0 0.5. Well, I think the closer it is to 1, the more likely it's going to be. And 0 0.9 is certainly closer than 0 0.5. So that would give me B. And which event is certain to occur is actually C. And one last question before we move on to a really funky piece of maths. The letters of the word piano are written on five cards. So let's draw a picture. One, two, three, four, and five. And there's my P, I, A, N, O. And there's nothing wrong with drawing a diagram. And one card is drawn at random. Okay, list the sample space. Well, there we go. The sample space, squiggly brackets, P, comma, I, comma, A, comma, N, comma, O. Find the PR. Now, what does this PR remember? What does that mean? Do you remember? 
It means nothing more than find the probability. And probabilities can be expressed as a fraction, as a decimal, or as a percentage. And the question will generally tell you what it wants it to be. If they don't give you it, you're always best to express it as a fraction. And so, how do we do this? Find the probability, and looking inside the bracket tells you what it's looking for. The letter A is chosen. So, question, how many A's are there? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there is one A out of. Remember that divide sign means out of, and there are five cards to choose from. What about the probability a vowel is chosen? Well, vowels are A, E, I, O, and U. So, where are my vowels? A is a vowel, I is a vowel, and O is a vowel. How many does that make? That makes three out of how many in total? Five. What about the probability a consonant is chosen? Well, consonants are everything that are vowels, and there are two of those out of five. And the probability that the letter chosen is not an N. So what we do is we see how many letters are not an N. One, two, three, four. Four letters out of five. Wow! Now, that word we used a moment ago, the letter or the word not, is actually really, really important in maths. Why? Because maths is a big fat trick and sometimes questions will be easier than we think. So, if we actually know that there are two events, there are two outcomes for a particular probability, all right? then we know that actually each probability, each of those probabilities, when added together, I can't spell added for some reason, will always make the number one. Now why is that? Well remember, in probability the number one means that it is certain. It is certain to happen. And where we have only two outcomes, and so for an example, we have the probability of heads or tails for a coin. We know that if we don't get a head, that obviously we're going to get a tail. So if I told you the probability of getting a head was a half, hopefully we would all know the probability of tails was equal to a half. Why? Well, we know that for a standard coin, the probability of getting a head is a half which would mean the probability of getting a tail is always also a half. Now, you guys may be looking at it saying, well, yes, because we know there's one head out of two, and there's one tail out of two. But what happens when you add a half and a half? Well, a half a cake and a half a cake added together gives you a whole one. O-M-G. Well, it has to be one, because it's certain for a coin that I'll get either a head or I'll get a tail. So, if the probability of getting a head was actually 1 out of 3, then what would be the probability of getting a tail? Now, obviously, this coin would be biased. Well, what we need to say is, well, we know that this and this, because it's the only two outcomes, must add to make 1. So, what do I add on to 1 third to get a whole one? Well, if we think about a cake split into three pieces, and one piece has been gone to a head, then it must be two-thirds will be a tail. Whoa! Now, we don't always have to deal with fractions. We can deal with decimals. And here is an example of a decimal. If, it's, if the PR range, so if the probability it rains is 0 0.3, what is the probability it doesn't rain? Well, it's either going to rain or it's not going to rain. There are only two possible outcomes. And we know both of these outcomes, that raining and not raining, must add to make one. So 0 0.3 plus something must equal one, which means the probability it doesn't rain. Now, in maths, when we do want to write doesn't, we can put a line on the top of it, must be equal to 0 0.7. Why? Because 0 0.3 plus 0 0.7 is one. And again, snowing and not snowing. There are only two occasions where it's either going to snow or it doesn't snow. There's not a third event. So we know that snowing is 0 0.1. So the probability of snowing must be 1. Take away 0 0.1, which is equal to 0 0.9. Woo! And the last one here is if it's night, what is the probability it's not night? And again, there's only two possible outcomes there. Night and not night. So if it's night, it's two-thirds. 
then that must mean the probability that it's not night. And again, I'm going to put night with a line above it must be 1 out of 3. Why? Because 2 thirds plus 1 third is equal to 1 whole 1. Right. This is the important rule. The probability of something happening added to the probability it doesn't happen is always 1. We now know this. This is the end of this lesson. I look forward to seeing you next time.